want my angel back. I want to know what happened. If anybody has seen her, to please call the men or police. No one would ever think that she wasn't going to come home. No, we would never think that that would happen. She went down and pulled on a pulled on something. I just thought maybe that she was uh, somebody hit a deer or something. I ask him if he knew whether she was alive or dead before he stabbed her. He said, no, she was alive. I could see her, she was still breathing. Angel Ormston was 17 years old in the summer of 1992. She had been born and raised in a middle-class suburb of Menor on the Lake, Ohio. She, like many other teens around Mentor, attended the local Mentor High School. Angel was a fun and outgoing girl. Her friends described her as a well-liked person, known for her radiant smile and her golden blonde hair. She was really lighthearted. Always wanted to have fun. She loved to drive around, listen to music, and hang out with her friends. Just loved to have a good time. She had her own car, so she had the freedom to travel around town as she pleased. A hot spot in town was the Great Lakes Mall. Angel loved to hang out here in her free time and she also had a part-time job at the Burger King located inside. Late one Friday afternoon, Angel told her mother she was heading up to the Burger King where she worked to pick up her paycheck and run some errands. However, by the next morning, she still had not returned home. At first, Nobody was alarmed because Angel would often spend the night at her friend's house, so her mom just assumed that she was there. Angel didn't really have, I wouldn't say, a lot of rules. Her mother, she was pretty lenient. Angel didn't really have to check in so much. On the Sunday, Angel's older brother drove to the Great Lakes Mall to do a bit of shopping. But when he pulled up in the parking lot, he noticed something that alarmed him. Angel's 1981 light-colored Honda Civic. He went over to Angel's car and when he looked inside, he saw Angel's purse and hairbrush laying on the seat. He called their mother who came down and collected Angel's car. She still thought that Angel was probably with her best friend, Stacy. She began to phone Stacy's house. But there was no answer. This was when Angel's mother began to get worried, and she eventually decided to phone the police and report her daughter missing. The last time Angel had been seen was July 31st. It was now August 2nd. When asked why she had waited so long to report Angel missing, her mom said that she was under the impression she had to wait 48 hours. Once again, Jackie turned to Angel's best friend, Stacy. If there was anyone who knew where Angel was, it would be her. We talked every day on the phone. We went, you know, we were with each other almost every day. I spent the night at her house all the time. We were always together. However, this particular weekend, Stacy had been at her sister's house baking cookies. But when Jackie finally got a hold of her, Stacy was stunned. She had no idea where Angel could be, and she hadn't seen her all weekend. This was horrifying news to Jackie, who had assumed that her daughter had been with Stacy since she left on Friday afternoon. In her voice, you could tell that she was very upset about Angel not being around and not knowing where she was, frantically asking me where I was all weekend and that the police were looking for me and wanted to ask me some questions about where Angel was. The Mentor Police immediately launch a large-scale search, with Larry Fisht appointed lead detective on the case. He started with a thorough search of Angel's car. 
There was no signs of foul play, and there was no physical evidence of any type. I mean, there was no blood in the vehicle, or there was no damage to the vehicle. Nobody close to Angel could understand what would make her want to get up and leave town. She was popular, outgoing, and well-liked, and also had ambitions on going to college in the future. Investigators began to look into the possibility that Angel may have been abducted. Her car was dusted for fingerprints, and there were dozens found. However, they were all traced back to Angel's family and friends. Detective Fisher first checked with her dad's trucking company. Dispatch sheets shown him to be several states away at the time of Angel's disappearance. He went on to request that Angel's mom, Jackie, submit to a polygraph. But to the surprise of the investigators, Jackie refused to take the test. Investigators began to look more closely at Jackie and her odd behavior. They questioned why she not only took so long to report her daughter missing, but also if she believed that Angel was met with foul play. Also, why did she move Angel's car, possibly disturbing any evidence? The police, however, had no hard evidence against Jackie and no legal way to force her to take the test. We moved off of uh, the family and pursued other avenues. The police decided to look into the last place Angel said she was going, the Burger King where she worked. Only, when they get there, her co-worker said that she never showed up and her paycheck was still there. Angel's co-workers alarmed investigators, however, when they told them they already had an idea what may have happened to Angel. They explained to investigators about a strange male manager who liked to prey on the young female workers often lurking nearby when they changed into their work uniforms. The door was cracked where they changed at work and he would peer around the corner to get um, a look at the girls while they were changing. Angel had mentioned that one of the people that she worked with made her nervous, made her uncomfortable. He was watching her. He makes some sexual comments towards her. This manager was eventually fired for sexual harassment, including the times he had inappropriately touched some of the girl workers. When investigators looked into the man, they found he had a record for having contact with underage girls. The workers went on to explain that the manager had a fixation for Angel in particular, watching her work and making sexual comments towards her. They also said that he found every reason to talk and get close to Angel in the cramped kitchen. This newly uncovered information catapulted the manager to the top of the suspect list. The police quickly tracked down the suspect, but he denied having anything to do with Angel's disappearance, and he had been nowhere near the Great Lakes Mall that day. In fact, he had been working at another fast food chain at the time and even had the timesheets to prove it. Investigators didn't let go of the theory that Angel's disappearance had something to do with the fast food restaurant. They once again questioned the employees and the manager, and uncovered a secret that Angel had been keeping from her family. It turned out that Angel had actually been fired from her job, for always coming in late. And while she told her mom she was going to pick up her last paycheck, she didn't mention that it would be her final one. Everyone connected to her workplace was eventually cleared. Police were once again back to square one. She wasn't the type to have enemies, and was a kind and trusting girl. Investigators were inclined to believe that it may have been this trusting nature that enabled someone to take advantage of her. Those closest to Angel were stumped as to who would want to do her harm. In most cases, the last person to see a victim alive is usually the one that has done something sinister. In this case, it was Angel's best friend, Stacy. So investigators decided once again that Stacy was definitely a person of interest. Police decided to ask Stacy to come in and talk with them, and this resulted in a four hour long talk. That was scary, being considered a suspect and you're 
friend's disappearance. Yeah, that was scary. Stacy was very willing to provide investigators with all the information she knows, but her alibi always remained the same. She was at her sister's house the entire weekend. She did, however, give investigators one possible lead. She mentioned the name of a boy at their school who she says they should look into. Mark Sadka. Mark was a 19-year-old boy who had just graduated with honors from Mentor High. Stacy said that Angel thought very highly of Mark and wanted desperately to have a relationship with him. Only Angel's closest friends had known that Angel had been seeing Mark over the summer. Stacy went on to reveal the biggest secret of all. Angel was pregnant. She said, I think I'm pregnant. What are you going to do? Um, she just said that she was going to tell Mark. She was hoping that she would go to Mark and say that she was pregnant and Mark would in turn say, okay, let's do this. Let's be together. Mark, however, was to attend the Akron University and was said to have just been leading Angel on over the summer. He didn't appear to have any intentions of getting serious with Angel. The police immediately hauled Mark Sadka in for questioning. At the station, Mark was very surprised that he was being considered a suspect. Yes, he did have sex with her one time, but uh, they were not seeing each other on a steady basis, and that he had not seen her in some time and denied that he and Angel were together, let alone she could be having his child. He said they slept together once, but has not seen her for an extended period of time. He then claimed that he in fact had a steady girlfriend, and they had been together for two years. He claimed that on Friday night, he worked until 5pm, then went to the mall to get a gift for his girlfriend. He later met up with some friends for pizza, Police started checking his alibi. They started with his job. We went to the dealership where Mark worked to check his time card and he was in fact there until 5 p.m. that day. They spoke to the friends that Mark claimed he was with that night. They confirmed that he had met at 9 p.m. for a pizza and movie. They confirmed that he had met them at 9 o'clock for a pizza and a, and a movie. However, Mark couldn't produce any witnesses for the shopping trip. When investigators questioned employees of the stores that Mark claimed to have entered, nobody recognized him. This led investigators to doubt Mark's story of his time frame. He had to know something. We thought that he would know where she was, for sure. Because of this hole in his evening, investigators asked Mark to undergo a polygraph test. Mark passed the test with flying colors, and it showed that he was not being deceptive with his answers. Due to Mark's cooperation and the polygraph test, he was no longer deemed a suspect. I just want my angel back. I want to know what happened. If anybody has seen her, to please call the men or police. Angel's friends made flyers and had them hung up throughout the community. Locals reached out to businesses, charities, and organizations to scrape together a $10,000 reward for Angel's return. The whole community was focused on this case. You know, kids like this just don't vanish. Within a month, thousands of tips were pouring into the Mentor Police Department. Police worked endlessly through the tips but to no avail. Yeah, she's still missing. Every day we'd get 100, 150 tips, and we would try to categorize those tips on credibility and, you know, uh, if they fit the scenario. Color was the bear. Is it possible that I get a phone number from you? What was she doing at the time? The police felt frustrated that they couldn't do more, and I think the family was frustrated that the police weren't doing more. Angel had now been missing for over three months. Her case was growing cold, but her mother did not give up hope. Jackie left a message on her answering machine for Angel, 
in case she ever phoned home. On December 15, 1992, when a local man and his dog went out hunting. She went down and pulled on, a, pulled on something, and I thought maybe that she was, uh, somebody hit a deer or something. During the outing, the dog picked up a scent and headed towards a drainage ditch. So I went down there to holler at her to make her go on, and when I went down there, that's when I seen it. It was at this point that the man noticed a large shape wrapped in a sheet with a rope tied around it. As he pulled back the fabric, he spotted what appeared to be a human hand. It's not something you want to see every day. The forensic team gathers the bones and sifts through the dirt, looking for any additional clues, which would lead them to the monster that carelessly discarded the remains of a human being, like they were nothing more than a bag of trash. The coroner used dental records to confirm that these are indeed the remains of Angel Ormston. The news spread throughout the small town, and the community was left horrified. The thought that someone had murdered her I don't think ever really came into any of our minds. We were all in shock. Her friends were all in shock. Our families and knowing how she was left was really, uh, really hurtful and really hard for all of us. An autopsy showed that Angel had blunt force trauma to her head and had also been stabbed twice in her chest with a sharp object. The coroner identified those stab wounds as the cause of death. She had been stabbed with such force that it left clear breaks and clear defining evidentiary marks in her rib cage and other parts of her body. Police now at least had physical evidence to try and trace back to the killer. In particular, the forensic team managed to find a patch of blue carpet fibers stuck to the duct tape. Now on the hunt for the matching blue carpet, police composite a list of all the homes connected with Angel, including her family and friends. One of those homes belonged to the parents of Mark Sadka, the boy who Angel had been seeing over the summer. At the time of her murder, no one was living in the house, as it was up for sale, but Mark had been using it. They had uh, had the house up for sale for eight or nine months, and it was vacant for some time, and it was found that uh, Mark's mother and Mark were the only two people that had keys to the house prior to the new owners moving in. When police went to look at the home, it had been sold. However, with permission from the new owners, they were able to conduct a search. It was found that the owners had completely remodeled the house, except for two rooms, including the basement. I noticed that uh, going down the stairs into the family room, there was blue carpet squares on, on the steps. These carpet squares were uh, taken as evidence to be compared with the blue carpet fibers of the uh, recovered from Angel's remains. It was a match. There were tiny blood spots on the carpets, stairs, and walls, and a bloody thumbprint was also lifted. The day after discovering Mark's basement of horrors, five months to the day of Angel vanishing, the police arrested Mark Sadka for her murder. He wanted to make something out of his life, and he just seen that uh, Angel was a step in the wrong direction. Here's this girl who he didn't have real feelings for that was gonna ruin his entire life by having his child and he didn't want it. And then he'd have to pay to support her and, and the child. And there goes his uh, professional career. Mark's demeanor was still defiant and he was trying to convince police that they didn't have enough evidence against him. Meanwhile, investigators were examining his car. Although Mark had tried to scrub his car clean, the job wasn't thorough. Traces of blood were still in the trunk, and a roll of green duct tape was still in his car, 
the same type that Angel was bound with. When Detective Fisher confronted Mark with all the physical evidence against him, he finally admitted he did something stupid. I think I could see the handwriting on the wall. He uh, said, yeah, I did something stupid. And I said, what was that? I killed her. I asked him to explain to me how he killed her. And uh, he told me that he had taken her to the house with the intentions of having sex. And when we got to the residence and met her. No, I have to tell you something. No, seriously, I have to tell you something. She had told him that she was pregnant and that uh, he was a father. My life, okay? Our life. Our life. Family. He insisted Angel have an abortion, but she refused. Stop, you're having an abortion. This is my life. Stop yelling at me. You're scaring me. Said he punched her several times and she fell down. <laughs> ran upstairs and got a knife out of the garage and came back down and uh, he stabbed her twice. I asked him if he knew whether she was alive or dead before he stabbed her and he said no, she was alive. I could see her, she was still breathing. Mark wrapped her body and used the clothesline around her legs to drag her up the stairs. He threw her in his car, and then drove her out to the woods where he dumped her body. Afterwards, he cleaned up before meeting his friends for dinner. Mark had sat around eating pepperoni pizza and laughing with his friends. All the while, Angel's body was laying in a shallow grave. At the end of his interview and confessions, Mark was charged with Angel's murder. Mark led police to the roadside location where he threw Angel's car keys, then to a remote site where he threw the knife. However, this would never be recovered. Mark's motive for killing Angel was crystal clear. He saw Angel as a step in the wrong direction. He had no feelings for Angel but would have to pay to support her and their child. In order to avoid the death penalty, Mark pled guilty to aggravated murder and kidnapping in February of 1993. Mark Saka is not your typical killer. Uh, he's a suburban kid who's got uh, ambitions of being some engineer and wearing a white collar and a suit jacket to work every day. He was not this hulking, lurking, diabolical looking character he was he was the kid next door he passed a polygraph test he had he had never been in any trouble his grades were good he was a normal kid i hope he's in prison for a really long time and i hope his life there is hell i really do even though it's been 20 years since her murder i miss her because she was a wonderful person i want people to remember angel's smile and her friendliness and her outgoing nature that she had. I just want them to remember who, who she was and how tragic it was that she's not here anymore. It's a loss for all of us. I miss her very much. I think in a sense, the community itself had drawn together, become closer. Um, Angel sort of became everyone's child. It's such a tragic ending for such a beautiful girl. 